Here we go. So good afternoon, everybody. And uh, welcome to the fourth Ingenium Staff Academy webinar. So my name is Tina Lukkainen, and in addition to my senior lecturer's job at uh, XAMC, I also work for the Ingenium Staff Academy. And the main objective in the Staff Academy is to bring teachers and lecturers and researchers together to share their best practices and learn from each other. Life Staff Academy is organized twice a year and there we highlight one pedagogical innovation from each partner university. However, we get so many excellent proposals in the call for papers that we want to showcase as many of them as possible. And that's why we are here today. And uh, we have started a series of webinars to give a chance to everybody to share their innovations. And today we have three presentations from our partner universities in Spain, Ireland and Finland. First of all, teacher and researcher Marta Garcia San Pedro from the University of Oviedo will present the Didacticac TV for educational videos. And uh, secondly, lecturer Anna Marie Greenley from Münster Techn Technological University will introduce the Giving Voice to Values pedagogy which supports people to act on their values in times of adversity. And finally, language specialist Kai Weaver and project manager Tina Barkonen from Southeastern Finland University of Applied Sciences uh, will tell us about the call for joint education lab projects at Ingenium European University. And the presentations will take about 15 minutes. And after that, we will have some time for comments and questions. And of course, you can comment in the chat all the time, also during the uh, presentation. And first, I would like to give the floor to Marta Garcia San Pedro. Okay, thank you. So um, I'm going to start my presentation. So it is called Educational Video Generation Didactic Tag TV Project. My name is Marta Garcia San Pedro. I am from University of Oviedo, Spain. Didactic Tag TV Project is a didactic project belonging to the Innovation Project Calls from 2018-2024 in University of Oviedo, Spain. This project was designed by a group of researchers and teachers from the training and education family fa faculty in this university. And through the portal web Didactic Tag TV, hundreds of educational videos were produced but univers by university students and teachers, and these were disseminated. The objectives of this project uh, were um, the following. Didactic Tag TV was designed to connect students and teachers within the teacher training and education faculty, connect these students and teachers with different education faculties from Spain and from other countries, such as Poland, Japan or Cuba, and share the videos produced with, with, the didactic tag, with the didactic tag community and develop student teachers' professional competencies. This is a photograph of the, um, of the web portal. This is a drawing of the Faculty of Education. As, as you can see, the name is Didactic Tag TV, and we've got uh, three different sections. One is University of Oviedo, um, the other one is other universities, and we've got a third section called schools. 
and the page can be uh, viewed in English or in Spanish. You're going to go to the to the page, and here you will be able to see uh, that, for example, in University of Oviedo, we've got all these areas of knowledge in which uh, teachers and students have been participating. For example, we've got here English language and how we've got uh, teaching English as a foreign language. And then three other sections that could be early childhood education, primary education or secondary education. Or, for example, we've got, uh, I don't know, music and um, here we can find videos related to music, for example, or um, here experimental sciences. And we've got on not only early childhood education videos, but primary, secondary, and videos for master in biotechnology of environmental and health, for example. We've got other universities. Uh, other universities that are uh, also participating in the project, and we've got a lot of schools too. Here. Here you can see, um, you know, the sections that I was showing you before, we've got 11 sections in University of Oviedo. And at the same time, they've, they've got some others, you know, in which they are divided. Videos are uploaded here, depending on the tem thematics and depending on the audience that they have been uh, addressed to. For example, these could be videos related to uh, students or pupils in early childhood education. This is one of the channels for early childhood education that's called Taller de Cuentos en Inglés. It means uh, a workshop or a storytelling workshop for infant education children. And in this channel, lots of videos made by students and teachers were uploaded. Um, and they are, in this case, uh, in English. Sometimes they are also subtitled. Some of them are subtitled in English, some others in Spanish. And um, they, the main objective of, this, of these videos is to create uh, some materials to be sent, to be seen by uh, children at the schools. Sorry. Um, in this, sorry. In this section, other universities, we've got the name of the universities participants or in the project, and sorry again, and we've got uh, La Universidad Complutense de Madrid, Kyo University in Japan, Marie Curie Sklodowska University in Poland, in Lublin, Poland, and three others the other uh, Spanish um, universities, such as Castilla-La Mancha, University of Córdoba, and University of León. Here you can see the channel of Kio University and the products they have been uploading. They are digital, um, they are educational videos addressed to different type of students, type of children, and some of them are in English, but some others are in Japanese, as you can see here, okay? Um, the project was uh, developed, was being developed, and there was a second step. And same primary and secondary schools were invited to participate in the project. They created their own YouTube channels and produced their own didactic videos. They were all linked to the Didactic Tag TV portal web, and the main aim was to disseminate their own videos, interact with other schools, and with the teacher training and education faculties. 
This way, participant teaching training faculties and schools might start different interactive and collaborative processes. Here we can see in the section schools, some of the schools that are taking part in the, in the project. Some of them are primary schools, some others are secondary schools, and some of them are from our region, the region of Asturias in the north of Spain, where the University of Oviedo is located, but some others are from different regions and other regions, okay? This is an example of one of these school uh, channels. In this case, is the school called Buena Vista 2, and this is the logo of the school. And this is an example of its channel where, where they are, you know, uploading didactic, didactic videos related to different matters that they are they consider uh, relevant for them or relevant for the community and they, will, they would like to share them. Now, I would like to talk to you about the project. Uh, participants from the University of Oviedo. And we've got more than 40 teachers participating in the project six years. Uh, were part, and more than 400 videos were produced. Um, other universities, uh, from other universities, there were 11 teachers participating last year and 18 primary and secondary school that have been taking part in the project. Uh, in order to assess the project, we have used a quantitative methodology, applying an ad hoc questionnaire with a Likert scale one to five. And in this case, it was addressed to university students. Uh, we pretended to know the students' perceptions about the project. The category of analysis were motivation, pedagogical competence, communicative competence, cooperative competence, artistic competence, and digital competence. The sample of this uh, study was 983 students, and they were students from 2018 to 2021. The results shows that all the items were valued over three. Uh, remember that the liquor scale was one five. So items such as adequacy to the learning situation got a score over, over 3. Point, uh, sorry, 3.49. The most value item was products. It's, it means videos, and it was 4.2. Satisfaction with the learning situation, 373. Utility of the task, 420. Cooperative competence, 414. Digital competence, 329. Or producing videos, 413. So in conclusion, we could highlight the high degree of interest generated by the project motivated students and they can be video generators and video consumers at the same time. It means prosumers. Some of the findings show an ample variety of formats, reveal a multicultural and multilinguistic richness and videos are absolutely heterogeneous. Students consider that the project has highly improved the pedagogical and professional competencies and cooperative competence obtain the highest scores in their research. This project has been related to some other projects, especially these OIR Innovative Resources for Distant Learning, co-funded by the Erasmus Programme of the European Union. And here I would like to show you some of the 
publications, some of the uh, research published on the project. Um, as you can see, there are a lot of uh, journals, relevant journals that have published um, some research on our project. So I would like to, uh, I would like you to ask us if you need any question or if you need any reference about it, if you want to consult anything, just please let us know. And thank you very much for your attention. Our email is garciafmarta.uniobi.es. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the very interesting presentation. It really must have been um, interesting also for the students and uh, multicultural experience mm -hmm. for them. Yeah, yes. Uh, now we have some time if anybody has any comments or questions. Please, you can just open your mic. I would like to ask one question. So were your students working together with the school children uh, mm -hmm. making the videos? Sorry, you were asking if they're working together? Yes, because you had uh, quite yeah. a few uh, primary or secondary schools involved. So yes. were they yes. working? No, we didn't work together. What we did was um to work um in different contexts so university teachers were working with the teachers sorry university students were working with the teachers inside their classes and they were preparing some didactic videos related to the course they were doing okay and these videos were addressed to primary or infant education children or secondary children secondary education um, at the same time, at the schools, these schools that were uh, working with us, um, you know, a bit later, they started to produce their own videos to create their own YouTube channels. And um, they upload all these videos in their channels. So what we do was to be able, we could, we could see what they were producing at the schools, they could see what we were producing in uh, at the faculty, at the Faculty of Education. And at the same time, we did, um, in the spring, last spring, we did a meeting, a uh, sort of gathering. We invited all participant schools, all participant university teachers, and we made a sort of conference in which they could be able to present what they have been doing at the schools or at their classes at university during these years. So exhibiting their products and um, trying to uh, produce an interest, you know, of these uh, productions for the rest of the of the audience. So it was a very interesting. Um, meeting because even we didn't know how many different things have been doing or have been done at the schools and at university during these six years okay so it was a very good idea to meet everybody to and to have this uh, individual presentation uh, in order to make a wide, um, you know, a wide uh, revision of the project. And we prepare a book about the, these presentations. And it's been also, it's been also published by University of Oviedo with all these experiences. Okay. Thank you very much for sharing. Uh, Eva, do you have a question? 
Thank you. Uh, well, actually, yes. Uh, thank you very much. A very interesting case and, and very impressive numbers of, of the results. So con congratulations on those. So um, were the students, uh, was it the obligatory course or how, they, how did they join to this project? Okay. You know, some uh, teachers and professors decided to uh, participate in the project. I was the coordinator of the project and I was offering uh, to uh, some teachers and professors I know. So they implemented the project in the courses they were offering a lot of those, okay? And, uh, you know, the idea of producing these videos was taking place in their classes. Uh, sometimes the students were free to decide what we're going to do, but it depended on the teachers. Some teachers decided to uh, give more um, def more I have to say strict instructions about what they wanted to be done. And uh, but, but videos were made in the classroom where teachers who decided what sort of videos they were going to to do. All right. Thank you very much for your presentation. Welcome. You're welcome. And now we can move on to the next one. So Anna Marie Marini, please, the floor is yours. Hello, everybody, and um, good morning from Ireland. It's it's still morning here, um, just about 23 minutes past 11. So I'm just going to share my screen with you. OK, can I just check that you can see my main slide at the right hand side? Uh, yes, we can. That's great. OK, so what I'm going to share with you this morning is the experience of I and a number of colleagues at Munster Technological University with an approach to ethics education called Giving Voice to Values. And I will include my email at the end and I would be delighted after today to engage further with any of you who would be interested in learning more about this approach and maybe collaborating with us in relation to its development. So as I said, I'm from Munster Technological University. That is a university that um, exists across six campuses in County Kerry and County Cork in Southwest Ireland. And in total, we have advance, in advance of 18,000 students across a range of departments academic programs and research centres. I'd like to share with you um, a picture of my colleagues here. And I just check that I have moved on to the second slide. Uh, yes, you yes. have. Yeah, that's great. Just wanted to make sure everybody was seeing what I was seeing. So this is a picture of I and a number of my colleagues at MTU who are involved in this project. The project is predominantly situated within the nursing department in which I lecture, but it also includes membership from our um, Research Integrity and Compliance Office. And it also includes one of our colleagues from engineering. This is a picture of us with Professor Brian Moriarty from Darden University in the US who has pioneered this approach and spent some time with us last March at MTU. So what I'm going to talk to you about over the next um, 12 minutes or so is a little bit about GVV, the method, the project that we engaged in here at MTU, um, a small scale study that we undertook after that project in terms of our own engagement with it, and the progress that we have made with the methodology to date. So first of all, GVV, the method. 
GVV is essentially an action oriented approach to values driven leadership. GVV is different to other approaches in that it exists in the post decision making space. So it moves beyond the analysis of ethical issues, the assessment of the decision to be made and into the decision making space. And it asks three key questions. What if I were going to act on my values? What would I say and do? And how could I be most effective? Professor Mary Gentile began working with this approach when teaching ethics to business students at Harvard University. GVV as a methodology and pedagogy has since expanded across the world in a range of different academic programs and beyond. So why did GVV interest me? As a registered nurse who subscribes to a professional code of conduct and encourages students to adhere to the standards and norms within that con code of conduct, it often concerned me as to the extent to which we oblige nurses and indeed other professions who have statutory commitments to comply with certain standards of conduct in their profession. But the reality in terms of doing that in the workplace can be very, very difficult. When people face pushbacks from authority, from circumstances, from structures, et cetera, that is beyond their control. And just sharing a paper here by Lashenko and Peter with you, which would be central to the discussion around nursing ethics and the extent to which nurses are free to fully act as moral agents because of the rules that they sometimes have within the healthcare service. So a little bit more about GVV as an approach. It first of all seeks to normalize value conflict in saying, first and foremost, there is going to be conflict in the workplace. There is going to be a clash of values in practical working spaces. It's very much evidence-based. It's based on a lot of psych social psychology and theories around um, habit formation. It's also, um, there's a growing body of evidence around GVV itself now and how GVV actually assists people to develop their own capacities to act as moral agents in their workplace. It's strength-based. A particular part of the program actually encourages people to reflect on their own strengths and bring those particularly to conflict situations around values and ethics, as opposed to thinking solely in terms of the obstructions. It's very much experiential. It's performative ethics in a sense, in that it encourages people to think about what they would actually say and do. It involves them scripting and rehearsing with their peers how they might act in times of value conflict. And in doing so, as we see at the bottom, in line with that broader understanding of habit formation, it hopes to develop over time a moral muscle as such, as Gentile describes it, so that even though the situation might not exactly be the same, the need to speak up in a time of adversity may have similar circumstances that would encourage us to draw on our habit, <clears throat> excuse me, or our experiences in the past. It's very much action orientated. That's something that I really liked about this methodology at the beginning in that it takes ethics away from the sometimes bad press that it gets in terms of armchair philosophy. As such, it takes ethics into the trenches, moves into that post decision-making space, as I've already said. Okay, I've applied the moral theory, I've engaged in the ethical analysis, I've decided on a course of action, how am I going to actually do it? It also acknowledges that we have more choices 
than we think we have. And that's something that we spend a lot of time exploring with our students. Because sometimes in a junior position, we may imagine that our remit is quite small. But in actual fact, we may have more power than we actually think. It also considers reasons and rationalizations that we use ourselves in terms of not speaking up and the way that we can almost convince ourselves that there isn't an issue here to prevent us from some of the moral distress that may arise if we feel there is a need for action and we feel unable to engage in that regard. So at NTU, we undertook a project around GVV. It was a national forum funded project which supported professional ethics, teaching and learning across three disciplines, engineering, social care and nursing. There was representation from academic and professional staff across multiple disciplines and campuses. And at the initial phase of that project, members of our learning community undertook an online program on GVV via Coursera, which is actually a free MOOC that you can undertake online. And we then looked at taking that um, online course in chunks, and then we fed back at a learning community meeting in terms of our experiences. Um, there is a project video link, which I will share with you in the chat at the end of this presentation. And I will also share with you um, the link to the GVV course itself, if it's something that you're interested in exploring. As we progressed through um, engaging in the program and sharing our experiences in the learning community, we thought that it would be a very valuable experience to capture some of these ideas in a qualitative study. So I undertook that project with two colleagues of mine at MTU, Dr. John Farrell from nursing and Dr. Sean Lacey, who's our research integrity and compliance officer. Um, this work has been presented at the International Nursing Conference in Barcelona last year and um, a publication is pending at the moment. Um, in terms of the study, just very briefly, um, we did receive um, ethical approval from our University Research Ethics Committee and it was conducted in accordance with ethics guidelines. In terms of um, the approach, it was a qualitative exploratory design where essentially it was a small scale study with the seven participants who completed the full MOOC and um, agreed to participate in the study. There were some others who undertook the MOOC but did not participate in the study. Um, they were invited to use Barton's reflective framework, what, so what, now what, to capture their responses. The programme is set up over three weeks, so we asked participants to complete this questionnaire at the end of every week in a diary-like format. Um, so collection at three points in time, and we undertook um, thematic analysis using Braun and Clark's thematic analysis. I'm sure many of you are familiar with those phases. We also used in vivo to um, categorize our data, but our analysis was conceptually guided um, by Braun and Clark in terms of interpreting finding patterns within the data. Um, in terms of our findings, um, our thematic structure essentially came up with, with three main findings. Our engagement with GVV and thoughts around that, the insights that we learned for teaching and learning with GVV, and finally, um, application, thoughts around application of GVV. So I'm just um, going to share a little bit of those findings with you. In terms of our engagement, there was a general sense that GVV was something different um, and that it did cross the decision action gap and asked different questions. People saw similarities with other approaches in their teaching, 
things like a mirroring, neuro-linguistic programming, and Edward Jabano's other hats idea in terms of looking at other people's um, approaches and perspectives. Um, there was also some sense that it linked with um, Badaracco's work around quiet leadership. Um, essentially at its heart was a sense that GVV focuses on this action piece and that it's creative, non-confrontational and strengths-based and provides a practical basis to act on um, one's moral convictions. Um, in terms of personal insights from my colleagues, um, people felt that in terms of reflection, that it provided them with their strengths and a list of strengths that they could draw on in times of future moral conflict, which is the goal of GVV. Um, people felt that when they looked at the rationalizations and pushbacks, that it very much struck a chord and they could find themselves within that narrative. People liked the idea of normalization. And one of our junior colleagues commented that they felt their position lacked authority, but that the levers of giving voice to values did provide them with some tools for implementing action in practice. In terms of further insights for teaching and learning, that it helped to open a dialogue. Um, people liked the importance of psychological perspectives. People liked that the approach was quite flexible, that it wasn't set in stone. Apologies, I see my camera has gone for some reason. I don't know why that's why. Can you still hear me? Yes, we yes, can. We can. Great, thank you very much. And um, people liked the idea of rehearsal, of discussion and getting others on board. And again, crossing the decision action gap and being action focused and highlighting choice. And um, there were some concerns about the methodology that um, perhaps the idea of hyper norms that it refers to maybe wasn't always congruent with the human rights approach now adopted in Irish health and social care. And there was some concern about what happens when issues move from the purely ethical into the criminal or legal regulatory frameworks. And there was some sense as well that maybe we need to be cautious about the complexity of context that students would actually be faced with and that they may find themselves in a vulnerable position if they perceive that acting in times of moral conflict will always be non-problematic. In terms of application, people like its pragmatism, and um, they felt they could use it to explore alternative ways of resolving conflict, that it could be used as a generic approach, even though all parts might not be applicable, and um, we did have a colleague who felt that specific to their area of practice, that they felt that it might not be useful for them. So a useful tool, but not for everybody. Um, in terms of the application and progressing, people felt that case studies would need to be more um, discipline specific. And that sometimes, regardless of the amount of interaction and dialogue, that some issues are unethical and need to be called out and that we need to explain that to students. And a general sense that the core elements of GVV were very good, but needed to be adapted for an Irish context and the need to ensure the psychological safety of students. So in short, um, GVV, pedagogically similar in some respects, but it's action orientated, normalizing, strength space and experiential focus is worthwhile and distinctive. Not for everybody, but it does provide, we concluded, a useful tool to augment, but not replace existing ethics of teaching and learning at um, MTU. Um, we did feel the need to consider legal, regulatory and cultural context in its application, be mindful of the psychological safety of students and develop GVV context-specific cases. 
which in terms of sharing GVV with our students and in terms of developing the project, um, here is where I and my colleagues are at at the moment. We had a case study workshop with um, Professor Moriarty from Darden University in terms of the how to of developing our own case studies and teaching notes that would be situated within the context and regulatory frameworks in which particularly our nursing students practice. Um, we identified two working cases at the end of last May. We now have had two graduates to join our group. Um, we're having a further workshop in October to develop those case studies. And our plan is that those cases would be finalized for dissemination with our students and within the wider GVV network in May 2004. And just very briefly to acknowledge the initial funders for the project. And here I'm sharing a picture of our MTU campus on a rather cloudy day at um, our Kerry campus in Tralee. So thank you very much for your time. I will stop sharing my screen and hopefully get my camera back on. Thank you very much for yes. the presentation. Now we still have a little time for any questions or comments you might have. Thank you, Anna Marie. It was really interesting uh, approach. Uh, what inspired you to use it in the first phase? Um, I've been teaching ethics to nursing students for about 15 years, and it was one of the things that most energized me over a long period of time. Because time and time again, you do, you know, you talk about deontology, you talk about utilitarianism, you talk about ethical principles, students have discussions and they say, yes, this is what we do. And then they say, but Anna Marie, you don't know what it's really like. And I say, well, yes, I do, because I've also worked in practice, but I hear what you're saying. And this is the first time that I felt that I now have some practical pedagogical approaches to say, okay, let's look at a case. Let's decide what you would do. Let's practice that. Let's rehearse it amongst your peers and then see how we feel about it. Um, so yeah, it did. It genuinely energized me as, as something fresh and something new and something that bridged that gap with students. Thank you very much. Uh, please, everybody notice Anna Marie's link in the chat also. Thank you. And uh, I think we will move on to our last presentation today. So Kai and Tina on uh, the Education Lab projects. Okay, now you probably see my screen. Okay, nice to meet you all. And uh, I'm like it was already said, Tina Parkkonen and I'm project manager in, in Genium and our work package five, which is dealing with innovative teaching and lifelong learning. And my colleague Kai is also here with me today. Hi, I'm Kai Weaver and I work as a language and pedagogical specialist at ZAMC, and I also work quite heavily in this Word Package 5 with Dina. Okay, and uh, we are many things going on at the moment in Ingenium and uh, different work packages. And uh, one of the top things in our work package is now this Joint Education Lab project call. And we are using this valuable time for telling you something about this call. And also we are really inter interested to answer if you have any questions yeah, and you would like to maybe apply yourself or tell about your colleagues about this project call. But something shortly, we have been working on this one week, uh, one year now with this education lab. And basically we have collected from our partner universities uh, 
information about their teaching labs. They can be virtual or physical labs, what they have, and how we could use them together and with cooperation. And we are thinking, this big picture is that we are thinking so that teaching uh, education lab can be anything where teaching or learning happens. So it varies very much from the different partner universities. And of course, the main goal is to cooperate with partner universities. And here you can see that primary goals is uh, encourage, of course, collaboration and knowledge sharing and to develop innovative teaching methodologies and also different kind of products in real life and uh, different kind of problems. Try to fix some something what's going on. Uh, we are hoping that Education Labs really brings uh, different uh, experts together and from different fields. And we hope there are teachers, RDA people involved and also students. Students cannot apply themselves for this Education Lab call, but uh, teachers can and they can involve also students and also RDA people. So it can be many things in this case. An initiative aims to support innovative teaching like our work package is all about and also learning and encourage cooperation between engineering universities and so that we know each other better all the time. Yes. And what is it, uh, Joint Education Lab projects? And project, and we have thought that it, there are some different thematic um, ideas what it could be. Of course, the cooperation between teaching per staff members and other experts is the most important important thing. And then, what this project could be, we are thinking about. They could be something about cooperations teaching. Uh, interdisciplinary collaboration to solve novel problems, also mm, developing uh, teaching methods, or updating and translating courses, which already are existing. And also, we are talking about micro-credentials and open educational resources in our work package. So it could be something planning uh, new micro-credentials or these short courses or wider courses. But of course, we are thinking that uh, in education lab project shouldn't be too, anything too big that it cannot be done, but something what is important and inter interesting for all engineering members. And then I think Kai, Michael. Yes, thanks, Dina. So as Dina said, what we're really looking forward at the moment is for some exciting applications and proposals for these joint education lab projects. If you're interested in applying, you should start to look for partners from within the Univer U European University Alliance and find people to cooperate with. Once you've found people, then you can start to prepare an application together. And as Dina said, this could be for refreshing courses, making them available to, within the Alliance, developing new education offerings, pretty much anything. The idea is that it's something innovative, exciting and wonderful, basically. And we want to give you this chance to develop something. And it's not just a pat on the back. There's the opportunity for actual money. So please keep listening and we'll get to that in a minute. So how do we assess these applications that we receive? We look at innovation, cooperation, multilingualism, and transferability. And all of these criteria are found on the PDF, which I shared in the chat. You're committing to completing a project within nine months and producing all the deliverables. These are exactly what you propose in the funding application. It's not very different from anything else you might apply for. The only difference is within a month of the project finishing, you have to host a webinar and talk about the project results, how it went and what you achieved together. So this not only shows us the great work that you've done for the Alliance 
in your project, but it also lets us know how the project and cooperation went in practice and what others might benefit from your experience. Next slide, please, Tina. So this is the juicy part. Every university has allocated up to 20,000 euros for this joint education lab call. There will be more calls in 2025 and 2026. This current call runs until the 17th of November, 2024. Each university decides how to allocate its own funds to its own staff members. And the amount awarded actually depends on the evaluation process, which is done in cooperation with partners. If this sounds a little bit complicated, it is. But please don't hesitate to ask me questions about how this goes. We have this sort of example. The funding can't be used to pay staff costs. However, it can be used for mobility, resources, translation, and other things. I'm sure that you can find ways to spend this money without paying salaries. For example, we have this example here that we will put together a project between Zamk and Hufte. Zamk would be the project lead. They prepare the application. They speak with Hufte originally in the beginning and prepare the application together, but only Zamk submit it. They both make a budget and they've applied for 3,000 euros. Zamk is applying for 2,500 and Hufte is applying for 500. And the budget is allocated as follows. 1,000 from Central for Mobility to visit Sweden, because Sweden's expensive, 500 for resources, and 1,000 euros for translation. And then Hufte is applying for 500, universi 500 universities, 500 euros for their mobility to visit Sweden from their own university. So there are different possibilities of how the funding can be used. This is just one example. We encourage you to apply and think about creative ways to spend our money that we want to give you. Next slide, please. So how can you find partners? The project lead should submit an application together with confirmed project partners found within the European University. You can search for partners using the Connect portal, each institution's web pages, and the Education Lab inventory. If you've been involved in projects like Staff Academy before, you can use the networks that you've made there. And you can also ask your local engineering coordinator or other colleagues to find. Don't be afraid to reach out, because as we know, if you're reaching out with the promise of applying for funds, most people are going to be quite interested in what you have to say. So be bold and brave. And you can find all the links on the website. You apply through the in education lab portal. This is what it looks like. The link is there. The application forms are quite straightforward. If you have any questions about the application form, you can ask us or send us an email directly or ask your local innovation coordinator. Be bold and ask whatever you want. The timeline of the joint projects, this is a little bit confusing, but the call opened is open already and it ends on the 17th of November. We will assess the proposals by the 6th of December and then inform people within a couple of days. Once this is done, you start working on the project in January and you have until the end of September, nine months, to deliver all the deliverables. By the end of October, you should have a webinar about the project results. And as you can see in January, there's a second call. So we encourage you, even if you're not successful the first time, to apply a second time and maybe a third time. You never know. Next slide, please. Oh, that was that. So short and sweet, lots of fast information. But if you have any questions and if you're excited about applying for the Joint Education Lab projects, please do ask. We're happy to answer any questions you have and get you funded. OK. Did we lost Dina? Other Dina. Can I ask a question? Please, yes, Martin. Please do. Yeah. So what I'm not quite sure about is what kind of application do you request? Is there any points that have to be addressed? Is there like a, a draft where we have several chapters to fill in? Or what is your expectation? Yes, there is a... The application form has many different boxes. Dina, do you have a link to the 
portal there. We can show. Yes, the I can. They are in chat, and I can also show it if you wish. I can share my screen. Also, we can show Thanks. it. Yeah. I show the application um, form, basically the PDF. Well, let me see. Let me see. I'll try to be quick, and so we have time here. Share now. Now you should be able to see the Engineering Education Lab call for joint project. This paper is also shared uh, via in via chat and in Engineering Education Lab pages. The, all the applications you have to leave them uh, via the portal, which is uh, also mentioned in the chat. So there, there are these um, certain information what we already went through. And then here are um, frequently asked questions if you might have. You can go them through about the funding and about who will, how the financial support might be arranged and also who can participate and what the project can be. And like Kai said, we are really willing to see different kind of we don't know, know exactly yet what they will be, so be brave, like I said. And here is also the um, review, how it will be accessed. So something, information about that, innovativeness, partner cooperation, multilingualism, and then impact and transferability, like I presented how the review will be done. And here are in the end of the paper, there are the questions that are in the application form in the web page. You can go this through via this PDF or then you or you can just go and register for the platform and start filling all the information there. You you will have to register first and you will be approved and then after that you have all the uh, access to fill these fields. Kai, do you have something to add here at this point? I'm scrolling this, but... Uh, no, just this. You can see that there's these different questions here that you can yeah. answer. It's a free form application, uh, but we do have these boxes to fill in to make it a little bit more transparent with the review policy so that we can see which bits are being assessed and where. And you can also upload a free form application at the end, but do fill in the boxes that are on yeah. the application portal. Um, Does that answer your question? Partly. So I'm not yes. really sure how much you expect. If I fill in the boxes and everything is said mm -hmm. with one or two pages, you say, well, that's a poor application. That's really a little information. Or um, I'm not, do we really have a feeling of how much you expect mm -hmm. from uh, the side? I of would say probably no more than two pages. No more than two pages. You know, would you say the same? Fine. Yeah. That was my question, basically. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> no. You got long. Uh, the, boxes are quite, the, the boxes are quite small. And it's more about your idea and letting us know what you want to do and how you want to spend the money. Okay, great. Thanks. Okay, any other questions? I see that Kelly is there. <laughs> yes, <laughs> hi. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Hi, how are you, <laughs> Tina? <laughs> um, yeah, I wrote in the chat um, the funding. From what I understood you saying, Kai, that perhaps mm -hmm. something like a serious game, which there are some free online versions of different mm -hmm. serious games, but some require money to to use mm -hmm. their their virtual version. And I'm assuming these types of cooperations would rather be virtual exchanges with our students online together, because I'm assuming there's not really funding for the students to travel to each other's university. Is that right? Probably not for the students, but for if the staff want to travel. Right. This is possible. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So the two questions, yeah, one question was answered yeah. then. It's rather for a virtual um, um, collaboration. And um, the other question was this serious game. So I have a few examples, um, which I can mm -hmm. send in the application. And 
Um, I was just thinking from what it sounds like that could be a potential use of the funding, mm. like a few hundred for a certain number of students to use one of these games together online. Yeah. Okay. And then it would be how you would connect that with other institutions within right. the Ingenium Alliance as well. Yeah. Yeah, I have one, like I'm writing with one who I met from the Staff Academy already, David um, Hanlon from um, uh, Munster University. And then I was thinking of reaching out to another person who I saw on mm -hmm. one document you've uh, published um, regarding also a serious game that she uses um, and maybe something there. And yeah. the other question I had would be if there, I see two potentials, should I apply mm -hmm. twice with two potentials or just focus on one and, and hope? <laughs> <laughs> or would you rather recommend maybe two because then one might mm, be? <laughs> it's completely up to you. Okay. If you have the time and the energy to submit two applications, go <laughs> ahead. And if you're not successful this time with them, you can always reapply in January for the next round. So Right. Okay. Okay. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Kelly. Wow. Sounds great. Uh, I'm sharing also that someone was asked, can we also maybe show uh, this portal or um, application? But uh, because... Maybe now we don't have time to go it through here in the portal. So it's basically in the end of the PDF and here it happens and the links are shared for you. First reg register and then you will be approved and then you can sign in and apply. And here is the PDF also if needed to find the information what we already short showed to you and information from Ingenium webpage. But we are over time, two minutes. Uh, <laughs> <so>. <laughs> Sorry. An interesting topic, obviously. <laughs> Thank you for... Uh, if you have any more questions, I'm sure Guy and Tina will be glad to help you. Um, now, if I can find the share, I will just quickly show you one page before you go. So uh, remember that we still have two webinars this year in November and December and uh, the bookings are open. So please encourage also your, your colleagues to join our webinars. So thank you very much everybody uh, for your active participation. And I hope to see you again in November. Thank you.